Welcome again to lecture number three. I'm Dr. Hebe Zer, and today we are going to discuss the histology of the second hardest tissue in the tooth, which is dentine. So as usual, I'm going to introduce the lecture outline for you. These are the features we are going to discuss in this lecture. First, we are going to discuss the physical properties of dentine as usual. Later, we will discuss the chemical composition. After that, we will discuss the histology of dentine, showing some histological sections and discuss the histological appearance under microscope. The features we should see, uh, mainly, we are going to see the dentinal tubules, the intratubular dentine, the dentinal tubules contents, and some regional variations in dentine. All these expressions will be explained and defined to you in this lecture. Mantle dentine, interglobular dentine, granular layer, hyaline layer, the circumfocal dentine, the predentine. Also, we're going to discuss the structural lines in dentine or the incremental lines. Finally, we will discuss the age related and post eruptive changes like secondary and tertiary dentine, sclerotic dentine, and the tracts. And we will dis discuss some clinical considerations. Usually, the slide that I discuss at the beginning of each lecture, which is the lecture outline, gives you a hint about all the histological features that you are supposed to know as a definition and to identify in any histological structure. So if you, if you are able to know all these uh, structures, I think you will pass the exam easily. But always remember, I don't use the slides I show you in the lecture and the exams. I always uh, show you or present you new slides in the exam because you are supposed to be able to read histological sections uh, and different from where did I get them. Dentine forms the bulk of the tooth. It's composed of large number of parallel tubules in a mineralized collagen matrix. The tubules contain the processes of odontoblasts, mainly among other structures or cells that we will talk about in details later. Dentine is a sensitive tissue because at the bottom layer of dentine, which is beside the pulp tissue, we have the odontoblasts and some nerve cells that extends into the tubules. We will discuss that also later. Dentine is a tissue that formed throughout life, physiologically and pathologically, and that also will be discussed in details later. First, we will discuss some physical properties of dentine. So fresh dentine is pale yellow. It's harder than bone and cementum but it is softer than enamel. The tubular nature of dentine renders it strong. That means it can withstand higher compressive forces, the forces that uh, happens when the teeth occlude with each other. Also tensile, which means two forces working against each other and flexural strength, they are all higher than enamel. Dentine is permeable, due to the tubular nature. And this permeability depends on the patency and size of the tubules. As the person ages, these tubules are occluded with dentine. So this, this permeability is decreased with age. The chemical composition of dentine. So dentine is composed of 70% of inorganic component, 20% organic component, and 10% water by weight. The inorganic composition, as usual, is calcium hydroxyapatite. The crystals of calcium hydroxyapatite in dentine are calcium poor and carbonate rich, much smaller than enamel hydroxyapatite crystals. They are found on and between collagen fibers. Do you remember when we discussed the solubility of a crystal's last lecture in enamel and how we relate a higher carbonate percentage in a crystal 
to something that is related to solubility. I'm not going to tell you what it is, what it is. Go back to the lecture of enamel and tell me what does it mean to have higher carbonate percentage in the calcium hydroxyapatite crystals. The organic composition, mainly collagen type 1. You will notice throughout all our course that collagen type 1 is the main component of almost all oral tissues. In dentine, it forms approximately 90% of the organic material in dentine. Also, we can see some proteins like dentine phosphoproteins, protoglycans, GLA proteins, and acetic proteins. We see some growth factors and lipids. All these components uh, are important, and I'm going to give you this as a self-reading um, homework. Go back to the reference book and read the organic composition of dentine. These components are very important for people who's thinking to work in regenerative dentistry in the future. As we can see here, the crystal, the hydroxyapatite crystal of dentine, is much smaller than that crystal found in enamel. The length is only 35, it was up, uh, almost 70 nanometers in uh, enamel, and the width is only 10, it was almost 26 to 30 in enamel. But the hexagonal shape is the same. As we said, it's more rich in carbonate, and these Hexagons are stacked over each other, as we discussed also in enamel. So, as I have already mentioned, over 90% of the organic matrix of dentine is collagen type 1, collagen fibers. We have also non collagenous proteins like phosphoforine. PPH is the main phosphoprotein in dentine, the most acidic protein known. And due to its high calcium ion binding properties, it has been implicated in mineralization, which means it has a role uh, in mineralization of dentine. The protoglycans, the main one is bulk glycan and leucorine. Protoglycan has an important role in collagen assembly cell adhesion, migration, differentiation, and proliferation. And so it may have a role in mineralization. The main glycosaminoglycans are chondroitin 4-sulfate and chondroitin 6-sulfate. They are very important. Remember these names very carefully. You will hear about them in many products in the future. GLA proteins like gamma carboxyglutamate containing proteins they are small proteins present in low amounts in dentine. They bind strongly but reversibly to hydroxyapatite crystals and they may have a role in mineralization. The acetic proteins such as osteonectin, osteocontin are also present in dentine. These uh, proteins are used in uh, histology or histopathology to identify the odontoblasts or the uh, product of odontoblasts in, in vitro or in uh, histological slides. Growth factors like insulin growth factor 2, bone morphogenic protein 2, tissue growth factor beta are found in dentine. They are absorbed from circulating tissue fluid. These growth factors are very important for the differentiation and regeneration of dentine tissue. 2% of the organic matrix in dentine is composed of lipids. Phospholipids may be involved in the formation and growth of apatite crystals. That's all I'm going to mention about the chemical composition and the organic matrix of dentine. But, but as I have already mentioned, I would like you to go back to the textbook and read the components of the organic matrix carefully and try to uh, remember these components as you will be introduced to them in the future in some products that are uh, used for regeneration of dentine tissue. So let's start with the histology of dentine. Dentine is composed mainly, as I have mentioned, 
the internal tubules that are in a, a matrix, an organic matrix. So these internal tubules, they extend from the pulp, uh, from the pulp surface to the amylodentinal junction and the cementodentinal junction. Maybe this is the first slide you're going to see showing the histology of dentine, so it's hard to you now to distinguish the tissues. But the more and more you are introduced into some slides, histological slides, the more you will be able to identify these structures. So this should be dentine here, uh, enamel, sorry. And these are the dentinal tubules extending from the dentine enamel junction to the pulp. Here should be the end of the dentinal tubules and the pulp will be in this region. The tubules follow a curved sigmoid curvature. As you can see, it follow a shape of S and its shape. This is called the primary curvature. When we cut the tubules in cross section, as you can see here, they are seen, they can be seen as circles. The team between the tubules here is called intertubular dentine. And the dentine in the tubules is called peritubular dentine. Inside these tubules, as you can see here, we can see the process, the odontoblastic process. So the tubules themselves are 2.5 micrometer in diameter at the pulpal end and 1 micrometer or less at the enamel end, which means the permeability of the tubules increases as we go from the enamel side to the pulpal side. After the odontoblast starts secreting dentine at the dentino enamel junction inward to the pulp direction, as they retreat inward, the tubules become closer to each other because of the surface. The surface becomes closer from the dentino enamel junction toward the pulp, which means 20%. Let's draw it again. This is a dentino enamel junction. This is the pulp. Which means if we take a cross section at the dentino enamel junction here, we will find 2.5% uh, of the cross sectional area occupied by dental dentine while it's almost 22% near the pulp. So the percentage of tubules increases as we go from the dentino enamel junction toward the pulp. So as I have explained earlier, the primary curvature the internal tubules takes an S shape that is, uh, can be seen from the dentino enamel junction to the pulp. In that pathway, the, the, uh, the tubule is not walking in a straight pathway. Sometimes it takes like a secondary curvature in the way. So if many tubules take this secondary curvature together, I can see a line like the one here. It's called secondary curvature. Secondary curvature because it came out from the primary curvature. As I said, if they coincide in adjacent tubules, we can see this line, which is called contour lines of Owen. So near the dentino enamel junction, as you can see here, remember how I discussed with you the shape of it would be like this scalloped in places where we have high occlusal forces like under cusps. At this in a dentino enamel junction, the tubules branches, terminal branches, a lot of branches near the dentino enamel junction. In the root, these branches actually loops. We will discuss that further in a few moments. So we will discuss the difference between the inter and intratubular dentine. The dentine inside the tubules, which is called the peritubular or the intratubular dentine, is composed when it's newly formed at the pulp surface from mineralized type 1 collagen. When it matures, the tubules is associated with deposition of another type of dentine. 
This formation of dentine can cause reduction in the size of the lumen, sometimes complete obliteration of the tubules. It also lacks collagen matrix, so it's lost in demineralization. And because it's highly mineralized, it has increased radiographic density. It is 10% more mineralized than intertubular dentine. So as we can see in these two different histological sections, this one is a ground partially demineralized section. So we can see some of the peritubular dentine inside the tubules. While in this section it's completely demineralized, you can see the tubules are empty. They look white because all the uh, peritubular dentine is demineralized. But the intertubular dentine is still there because it has higher percentage of organic matrix. The main protein in peritubular dentine is different from phosphophorine, the one we talked about in the chemical composition of dentine. The inorganic component is mainly carbonated appetite with different crystallites from the intertubular dentine. So what will we find if we looked inside these dentinal tubules? Actually, we will find many components. Among them, we will find the odontoplastic processes, afferent nerve terminals, antigen-presenting cells processes, and extracellular dentinal fluid. So the odontoplast, the cell that is forming the dentine, which lies actually uh, in the pulp. And as I have explained, the secretion of dentine begins here. You will take that in the embryology lectures. So the odontoplast initially was at the dentine enamel junction here. It started to secrete in a, a dentine in this direction while it retreats toward the pulp. So as you see, at different levels of the cell, you have different organelles in predentine area than the one in the what we will call later the circumpalpal dentine. We can see microtubules and microfilaments, intermediate filaments along the processes. You can see the key is here, the microfilaments. In the inner layers of the dentine, the processes occupy almost the full width uh, in the tubule, as you can see here. The tubule is almost occupied by the odontoplastic processes, while we have more space as we go toward the dentine enamel junction. The terminal dentinal tubules near the enamel can have any of these options, can contain any of these options. It can contain odontoplastic process, sometimes remnants of this process like tubulin and microfilaments. Sometimes it's only peritubular dentine. And that is caused because of the following. There's three hypotheses that explain why we can find different components at the end or the periphery of the dentinal tubules near the enamel. So sometimes the process that when the, the odontoblast retreats toward the pulp, the process stays in its place. We can find it at the terminal of the tubule. Sometimes there is a predetermined length of the process. So the cell retreats and the process retreats with it. And sometimes the process was there, but it has degenerated for one reason or another. The second component that we can find in the dentinal tubules are the afferent nerve terminals. So mainly present in the inner layer of the dentine. This is the afferent nerve ter uh, terminals we are talking about. They are mainly found in the inner layers of dentine. They have intimate relationship with the odontoplastic process and the odontoplast. The axons contain mitochondria and vesicles. The sensory terminals, they may found mostly in the coronal dentine beneath the cusps in 80% of the tubules. And it's sparse in the cervical and the root dentine. They are narrower than the odontoplastic processes, of course. 
Also, in the tubules, we can see antigen-presenting cells processes. They appear as small processes in the tubules near the pulp, and as you have already studied in the histology course, they are immunocompetent antigen-presenting cells. You can find them within and beneath the odontoplasts layer. The processes are limited to the predentine. We will come in a few minutes to what is predentine, so you would know what we are talking about. Sometimes they extend deeper in the tubules under carious dentine. Another component of the dentinal tubules is the extracellular dentinal fluid. The composition is different from one individual to other, but it has higher potassium and lower sodium ions level in comparison to other fluids. This balance affects the membrane properties of cell and gives positive force from pulp tissue into the dentine. It's a defense mechanism, which means uh, the, the components of this fluid makes the pressure in the pulp higher than that the pressure in the dentinal tubules, which makes the fluid comes out from the pulp uh, in uh, direction of the dentine and enamel to push the bacteria and any other uh, toxins outside the tubules. So now we will come to different regions that we can see in dentine. I'm going to mention them and then we will discuss them in details. The mantle dentine, the hyaline layer, the granular layer of tome, free dentine, intermediate dentine, and circumpalpal dentine. So the mantle dentine, as the name implies, it's a mantle like a jacket that we cover ourselves with. It is the most peripheral, first to be formed layer of dentine. It is 2 to 150 micrometer in width and differs from the dentine beneath it, which is called the circumpalpal dentine, because it's 5% less mineralized and the collagen fibrils in it is perpendicular to the dentine enamel junction. It has branching of tubules and it has different mineralization process that you will take in the dentinogenesis lecture. So as you can see here, this is the enamel. Do you remember these structures we've talked about that we can see at the dentino enamel junction and they extend to the surface of enamel? If you don't remember them, go back to the enamel lecture and see what was the name of these structures. So the uh, most peripheral layer of dentine just below the enamel is called the mantle dentine. It's 5% less mineralized than dentine. This is the circumpalpal dentine, which is the dentine that is in the middle of the crown between the peripheries. This is one end beside the enamel. This is the other end beside the pulp. Between these two peripheries, then we will discuss the other uh, peripheral uh, dentine here in a minute. But between these two different types at the peripheries, we have the circumpalpal dentine. And as I have said, the branching of terminal tubules happens in the mantle dentine here. We need higher magnification to see that here. Again, the mantle dentine, which is found at the periphery beside the enamel. A phenomenon that can be seen in dentine is, is what we call interglobular dentine. In dentine, the mineralization happens or starts in globules. So there's a calcification center and then calcification begins around it. So we have a globule or a calcifere and these calcifiers bigger, come uh, bigger and bigger in size till they all fuse together and form the, a uniform calcified tissue. If they fail to fuge, uh, to uh, fail of fusion happens between these calcifiers beneath the mantle dentine. This produces undercalcified intergloblular areas. They appear dark in ground sections. They are viewed under transmitted light. The tubules, the dentinal tubules, they pass through these areas without deviation, neither peritubular dentine. As we can see here, this is the enamel. This is the dentine enamel junction. The mantle dentine is here and you can see the branching 
we talked about under beneath it these cast spheres they fell to fuse uh, to fuse together they stayed as calcifiers and they can be seen in ground sections as black globules. Another phenomena that we can see in the root dentine, uh, in the peripheral, peripheral root dentine, is dark granular zone that can be caused by the tubules that branched at the periphery and they loop together on themselves, creating air spaces in ground section or they can be actually caused by incomplete fusion of calcifiers like the ones we talked about in interglobular dentine. They show as tree top appearance of tubules when they are filled with stains in ground section. They are hypomineralized compared to circumpalpal dentine. As you can see in this section, this is cementum, which we didn't discuss yet. And these are the odontoplastic processes. Maybe you can see here that they don't really walk in a straight pathway. They have their ups and downs, secondary curvatures. So at the end, these tubules are branches and they loop on each other. They are filled with air or stains in ground sections looking black like this. And sometimes these are just uh, unfused calcifiers. We are not actually sure. Maybe you have noticed this layer here between the cementum and the dent chain. This is called the hyaline layer. The hyaline layer is outside the granular layer. Uh, whether it originated from the dentine or the cementum, it's not actually uh, well determined. It is uh, about 20 micrometer in width, atabular and structureless. It helps the bonding of dentine to cementum. We can, we can demarcate the hyaline layer very clearly between dentine and cementum. So the circumpalpal dentine, as I have already mentioned, it forms the bulk of the dentine. It's uniform in structure, except at peripheries. Near the enamel, there is mantle dentine. Near the pulp, there is predentine that we will discuss in a minute. And also, under the mantle dentine, sometimes we have interglobular dentine. So near the pulp, we can see the odontoplastic layer of cells. These are the cells that are called odontoplasts that actually forms the dentine. So initially, the dentine is laid as a matrix. Then the calcifiers I just talked about starts to form. And then as the mineralization progresses, they fuse together to become uniform calcified tissue. So this is a pre-dentine, which looks actually lighter in color. And this area of the beginning of calcification where the calcifiers appear is called calcification front. You will take that in detail in the dentinogenesis lecture. The predentine is 10 to 40 micrometer in width and it's thicker in younger teeth. So if you remember we talked in the enamel uh, lecture about incremental lines, the lines that show us the rhythm of enamel deposition and mineralization. We had two kinds of lines, the cross striations, they represent a daily rhythm of enamel uh, deposition and the stria of ridges that represent approximately a weekly rhythm of enamel deposition. We have similar lines in dentine incremental lines here we call them von Ebner's lines that are similar to cross striations and Anderson lines which are similar to stria of ridges. Other structural lines that we can see in dentine are lines associated with primary curvatures of dentinal tubules, the S shape I talked about, and the lines associated with the secondary curvatures of the dentinal tubules. The curvatures these tubules have among the pathway of the primary curvature. All of these structural lines, they are approximately perpendicular to the dentinal tubules. 
So let's imagine that we had a longitudinal section of a tooth and we looked at the dentin. So this is shaped, the primary curvature that is is shaped from the enamel, dentino enamel junction to the pulp. For example, it's like this. When all these peaks coincide, the peaks of the S-shaped, they coincide with each other. They make a line we call Schrager line. They are hard to see in cross sections and they are sometimes really hard to distinguish for people that are not experienced. Also, do you remember that I told you that in the path from the dentin to the pulp, there is sometimes a turn or a secondary curvature that can be seen. When these secondary curvatures, they coincide with each, with each other, they form these lines that we call contour lines of Owen. So they represent coincidence of secondary curvatures. They are rare in a primary dentine. This slide is showing us how the odontoblast doesn't have a straight pathway. They have their own secondary curves along the way. So the lines that are related to primary and secondary curvatures of the tubules are called Schrager lines and contour lines of Owen. The lines that has to do with the incremental uh, or deposition of dentine are called the incremental lines, short-term striations, the von Ebner's lines, and the long-term striations, the Anderson lines. They are seen in ground sections, demineralized sections, under polarized light or micro radiographs. Exactly as in enamel, they show fluctuation in the composition of the heart tissue deposition. Here, fluctuation in acid-base balance effects the mineral content and the refractive index. Also, a change in collagen fibrous orientation in Anderson lines makes them more marked under polarized light. Remember how we seen the cross striations uh, that is 90 degrees to the uh, enamel prisms? We have the same shape here. Von Ebner's lines that are perpendicular to the odontoplastic the odontoplastic tubules. As you can see them here. In the cuspal dentine, every two lines are separated by approximately four micrometer. And uh, in the root dentine, they are uh, sep separate to every two lines are separated by approximately two micrometer. A higher magnification of one Ebner's lines. They are more obvious in this uh, magnification. Anderson lines are 16 to 20 micrometer apart. Every two lines has 6 to 10 von Ebner's lines between them, suggesting a 6 to 10 day rhythm of secretion, as we can see them here. They are hard to see. I will provide you with some slides that has a better view for Anderson lines. As an enamel, a neonatal line was an exaggerated stria of radius. Also here, a neonatal line is considered an exaggerated line of Anderson. This is a neonatal line in enamel. This is a neonatal line in dentine. So what happens to dentine with aging? and after the teeth erupts into the oral cavity. There is some physiological age changes like secondary dentine and translucent dentine, and there is changes associated with the entire nerve responses to stimuli 
or pathological changes like tertiary dentine, sclerotic dentine, and dead tracts of fish. So secondary dentine starts to form once the root is completed and the tooth comes into occlusion. It's very similar to primary dentine, but there is a sudden change in the tubule's direction, which gives us a contour line of Owen. It has a slower deposition, closer incremental lines, faster deposition on pulp floor, can cause narrowing of chamber and canals with age. As you can see here, the odontoplastic processes was having this direction and suddenly they turned in another direction, making a secondary curve that all actually coincide with each other, causing a contour line of Owen between the primary and the secondary dentine. Another slide shows us how there is a, a, a a change in direction between primary and secondary dentine, dentinal tubules, creating this line, the contour line of Owen. The translucent dentine happens when obliteration of the tubules with intratubular dentine. It happens more commonly in the root dentine. You can see him here, translucent areas. We can see what is there behind the tooth. Physiologic aging in root dentine leads to complete obliteration of the tubules with intratubular dentine. So the dentine will have the same refractive index as the intertubular dentine. This appears as translucent areas when we put it in water. When we cut the tooth or the root in a cross section, translucent dentine shows as a butterfly shape. This is due, of course, to the convergence of the tubules that I have already discussed with you. This increases with age, of course. Tertiary dentine, which happens due to, to, patho to a pathology or a stimulus, an external stimulus like caries or toxins of the caries, induce the pulp to produce more calcified material. Uh, it has many names depending on the stimulus that caused this formation of dentine. Irregular secondary dentine, reparative dentine, reactionary dentine, response dentine, and osteodentin. It has variable appearances and composition. It's mainly tubular, but sometimes it can be structureless. May contain few irregular tubules and sometimes atubular areas. As you can see in this slide, here you can see a well-structured, well-mineralized dentine. The tubules are there, the mineralization of uni is uniform, while here you can see an area of non-structured, not well-mineralized dentine. That is tertiary dentine. In the laboratory, I will show you that this tooth has a cavity preparation, which means it had a, a, a carious lesion that is deeded to cavity preparation, both cause this tertiary dentine formation. A closer look at this area shows us how it's not as structured as the primary and secondary dentine and is not as well mineralized. So at the primary stages of the stimuli, when the caries is in its early stages, the primary odontoplasts, they, the ones that are already there, they may be involved in secretion of the tertiary dentine. When the stimuli uh, continues, they induce the cells in the pulp, the stem cells, to differentiate into odontoblasts. They produce collagen type 1 and dentine CL protein into uh, the tertiary dentine. So what happens if the stimuli is slow going, like slow fissure caries or attrition? Both induce deposition of material inside the tubules, occluding them, causing what we call sclerotic dentine. As you can see here, there is slow growing stimuli, a fissure carry or a pit carry, which cause this area of dentine to be occluded to form sclerotic dentine. But what happens if the stimuli is very fast and very harsh?
What happens is this the odontoblasts that lie in the uh, pulp area, they are killed by the external stimuli. That results in empty tubules that uh, they might be sealed at their pulpal end by tertiary dentine. But when we see them in the section, in the histological section, they are air filled. So when we see them under light, they appear dark. And we call them dead tracts because they are air filled tubules. So like we see here in, the, in this slide, there is a harsh carious lesion here that caused the odontoblast in this area to die. These tubules are all empty, air filled, so they looked black under the microscope. And we say these are dead tracts of fish. That would be everything for today. See you in the laboratory section for dentine. I wish you all the luck. Bye bye.